All right, guys, if you will, take your Bible, turn to the book of Job chapter 40. Job chapter 40. Uh, As you know, we're getting really close to the end of this book. Lord willing, we will get done with Job 40 tonight. Now, if you're looking around, you know, that's 24 verses. However, uh, to kind of give you an idea, when I build a PowerPoint, uh, if it's a Sunday morning service, I'm, I'm about 25 to 30 slides. That's how I kind of regulate the deal. Uh, If it's a Wednesday night normal, eh, we're about 45. Tonight I have nearly 70. So we got we got to get moving uh, to get this going. So we're obviously in Job chapter 40 and we're in the midst of God calling out some things to Job and he started with creation, he got into light, he got in bizarre places, he got into weather, and he's basically just calling out Job, going, answer these things as I ask him. And he gave, got into this thing that we call Job's Zoo, or the Lord's Zoo, and he deals with 14 animals, and so far, in chapter 38 and 39, we dealt with the first 12. Tonight, we're going to get to number 13, and that ought to just... If you're a Bible student, ring your bell, because anytime the 13th dude shows up in Scripture, you need to pay pay close attention to that. Now, so we're going to start in chapter 40 with a new outline, and it's going to be going God's perpetual, excuse me, perpetuation of the quiz. In other words, he's just going to continue it on. But I want you to focus here for just a second. Look at verse 1. He says, moreover, the Lord answered Job. Now, notice here the wording here that God uses, moreover, meaning continuing on with what's been going on in 38 and 39. And he, notice here, though, moreover, the Lord answered Job, but then gives him a question. The greatest debaters on the planet do this. They ask or they answer you with a question. Jesus was the best at this. You ever look in Luke chapter 20 and they're like, hey, should we pay taxes? And we're all tuning in going, what's the Lord got to say about that? Well, I don't know if the Lord's down with the amount of taxes we are paying, but he is down with us paying taxes. And how he answers is he's like, Really? You want me to tell you whether you should pay taxes? Uh, show me your penny. Show me your coin. Whose superscription's on it? So he just starts railing back with more questions. And that's what God's doing right here. And he says to Job, he says, moreover, he answered Job, and he said, shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? In other words, Job, do you have anything you want to teach me? Now think about in the context. For two chapters, God has hammered Job with question after question after question. Not one word of empathy. Not any kind of mercy given to him. The man just lost ten kids seven days earlier. And yet God is coming at Job with almost ferociousness. And yet he stops and he says, Hey Job, since you couldn't answer all my questions... You want to ask me some stuff? You want to teach me some stuff? And all of a sudden, Job, now watch this. He that reproveth God, let him answer. In other words, uh, you ran your mouth before, Job. Let's hear it. You got something to say? Now, here's what's interesting. He's giving Job an an opportunity to speak. Now, don't forget, back here in in Job... uh, Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Job Job said before, hey, I want to be able to ask God a few things. You ever been there? You ever ever think about that? Hey, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this. No, you won't. You can just stop all that right now, get some help. That will not happen. Okay, now watch here. Notice what he says in verses 3 and 4. So here's God asking him. You got something you want to teach me? You got something you want to say? Now, what's interesting is Job has an opportunity. He has 10 kids who have just died. All of his wealth is gone. Don't you think he might go, God, why did you take my 10 kids? But watch his response. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, 
Shall he contend with? Okay. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? That's what happens when you come into the presence of God. All right, so I, I, I showed Mark, uh, Justin's dad, who was my mentor on stage uh, or up on the screen last week, uh, of him preaching in Israel. And, and, and my mind really began to think, because when I think about people coming into the presence of God, Mark's been there for almost two and a half years, which is a little mind-blowing, but for two and a half years. You know what he's been doing? He hadn't got off his face. He said, how do you know that? Read Revelation 4 and 5. When you and I get before God, when you finally get there, Trust me, I know the position you're going to be in. It's the same position that every individual who encounters God, they hit the deck. Because the problem is, is this. Now, remember, Job said, I'm vile here, right? Based on God's point of view, Job is a righteous, upright, askeweth evil Perfect in his generation. I mean, this man right here is the one that God said, Hey, Satan, what about this dude? And yet when Job finally... Now remember, Job for, for, for chapters defended his position. And he finally comes into the presence of God and here's his attitude. I'm vile. And you might think to yourself, I'm a pretty good dude. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. I, I go to church. I pay tithes. I help out the poor. I, you know, I'm, I'm nice to my neighbors. All that stuff sounds great. And when you stack yourself up against the guy out there, you may be a pretty good dude. But when you finally get in the presence of the Almighty, you'll realize how vile you are. I mean, that's how awesome God is. He is scary. He is so much more holy than we can even wrap our mind around. Now watch this. Isaiah said it this way. You remember this? Isaiah comes into the presence of God and he starts talking about the seraphims and all that and, and, and how the, uh, uh, the, the foundations of the temple were shaken. And he says, Woe unto me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. In the midst of people of unclean lips. He gets back with the same attitude to Job. I'm vile. My mouth's horrible. My, my life is horrible. When we stack ourselves up against God, we lose every time. Okay? Now, this is Job. All right? You remember uh, John? What happened when he came into the presence of Jesus? The Bible says that he says, and he's. He that had his right, he had in his right hand the seven stars out of his mouth, went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He didn't even want to breathe. That's one of the reasons why I can tell you when you say, well, I say you, when people in general say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God about that verse. Or I'm going to ask God why my dog had to die. Or I'm going to ask God, you know, fill in the blank. No, you won't. Because when you finally come into His presence, you will hit the deck like every individual who's ever done it. Ezekiel, Isaiah, literally all of them. John. And, and the reason I'm emphasizing that is sometimes we as Christians, especially in the Laodicean church age, is we begin to think like God's our buddy. Oh, you know, the man upstairs. You know, me and God, we were hanging out the other day and we were talking. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is absolutely holy. And when anyone comes into his presence, they tremble. That is what it means to come. And notice their mouths always shut. Isaiah is like, uh, here's what Job said. Let's go back to what Job, he says, I will lay my hand upon my mouth. In other words, I'm just going to be quiet. Now remember, he says, once I have spoken, 
but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Remember back in Job 23 when he says, Oh, that I, I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him. I would fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. How you doing on that understanding thing, Job? Here we are, thousands of years later, reading Job 38 and 39, and we don't have a clue. You think Job does sitting there in an ash heap? Now, he goes on, verse 6, Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now remember, we've already studied this whirlwind, we'll not go over it again. But notice here, he, he gave him an opportunity, verses 1 through 6, You got, any, got anything you want to ask me, Job? Oh, no? Okay, well, gird up your loins now like a man, and I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. In other words, oh, I gave you an opportunity. You popped off Job before, and now you're not going to speak? You got an opportunity to talk to me. Now, isn't it interesting that in all that, he didn't ask him anything? You lost 10 kids, and you didn't ask God anything? You lost all your wealth, all your health. You didn't ask God a thing? No, because what God has done through chapter 38 and 39 and now into 40 is to bring Job into the bigger picture. And what he's realizing is Job is realizing whether my kids live or die, whether, whether I have health or not, whether I have wealth or not, God is in total control. And what happens is when we see our little problems from a 500-foot view, it seems like it's, it's just encompassing us. But when you back off this planet from thousands of miles and look down, they don't look that big anymore. And that's exactly what God's doing to Job. Now, once again, where is the God that everybody puts out there that's going to come, oh, Job, you poor guy, I'm here to help you. That's not the God that shows up. The God that shows up goes, stand up, act like a man. I'm going to demand some things from you. Which is just wild. Now watch. He's going to ask four questions, and then he's going to give one statement, and then he's going to bring it. You know, okay, so you know here a lot of times when I'm trying to get you to follow me, or I go, hey, I know you're kind of nodding off, so hang with me. I'm going somewhere. This is one of these points where God's going somewhere. He's going to ask him four questions. He's going to make a statement. And then he's going to make a declaration. Now watch this. Let's look at these four questions. Will thou disannul my judgment? That's the first question. So remember, Job, you got anything to say to me? Oh, you don't? Then fine. Stand up. Act like a man because I'm going to ask you some questions. And here's question number one. Will thou disannul my judgment? Now watch this, because we live in a society like this that I want you to pay attention to. Burning of the Bible, right? So an atheist says, Bible isn't true. The liberal says, oh, you can't trust the Bible. People try to burn the Bible. You know, this, this is a big thing. So let me ask you something. Your disbelief of the Bible, does it change one ounce of truth in the Bible? Whether you believe it or not, whether you accept it or not, doesn't change the truth that's in it. It's, it's interesting when I, when I see people, back in my early days of Christianity, we were just dumb enough to go door to door knocking on doors. I figured if I could do it as a Jehovah Witness, then I could definitely do it as a Bible believer. So me and my brother-in-laws... Every Saturday for probably two straight years, we'd go knock on doors and invite people to church and, and all that. That's before it got a little nutty out there. But anyway, we come across this car that was just charred. And we looked in this car that everything was burnt except in the back seat. The leather had burned off, but the Word of God never burned. I mean, we were just, I wish I'd had an iPhone then. I'd have been snapping pictures, but I, we were just blown away. 
I was telling that story at work one day to this lost guy who, this weed smoker who worked for me back in the day, and said that when they were younger, they would take the Bible and pull out the pages and rip it up to make their weed, you know, joints out of. And he said, what was really freaky, and it freaked me out, is he said, no matter how charred that paper got, you could always read those words. And I'm sitting there looking at him going, and you can't least like see a, there's something must be up with this book. Like, but either way, my point of telling you all that is, whether you accept it or not, the truth of God's judgment is truth, whether or not you believe it. And it's not going to change anything. Well, I just don't believe the Bible. Well, okay, you don't have to, but it doesn't change it. Doesn't change the truth. All right, now, verse 9. He, so, so he at, no, well, we missed a, a verse here. Okay, well, it's not highlighted, but I'll show it. Will thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? That's the second question. Now, here is a key point that you need to really understand that when we begin to claim ourselves self righteous, in order to us to be self-righteous, we actually have to lower the righteousness of God. That's how this works. So, here's what happened. God has a standard way up here. And you and I are down here, and what he decided was, I'm going to send my son down to live for you so that we could bring you up to this level. What man does is try to be righteous where he is down here by bringing God down to man's level. And God's saying, oh, in order for you to be, will thou condemn me? Will you lower me so that you can become righteous? Now he's asking questions here, and I'm, he is going somewhere. So he asks, Will thou disannul my judgment? In other words, will you get rid of my word? No. Will thou bring me down so you can be righteous? All right, here, next. Hast thou an arm like God? Now, we're not going to trace all this tonight, but if you really want to do a word study sometimes, start studying about the, the arm of the Lord. And man, you can go all throughout Scripture. We've got, ah, uh, there's the verse I was looking for. I had them in reverse order. Now, this is really coming down to, Job, you want to arm wrestle? You want to test your strength against me? So when we were kids, nobody, I don't think anybody does this stupid stuff now, but when we were kids, we'd always, you know, let's arm wrestle. Let's see who's the strongest, right? Like, we're going to figure out who. Okay, and God's doing it to Job. Job, you strong enough to arm wrestle? Now, now watch this. God says when he brought out Israel... He, uh, he says, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. The strength of the Lord. Matter of fact, do you know what the strong arm of the Lord is? Which one? The right arm. Which is a represent representation of Jesus Christ. Right? He says in Deuteronomy, a stretched out arm. Alright, so now... I'm not trying to take a bunch of time here, but he's saying, will thou disannul my judgment? Will you do away with my word? Will you bring me down to your level so you can be righteous? Do you think you have the strength that I do, Job? Canest thou thunder with a voice like him? Now, now remember, where is he sitting? He's sitting in an ash heap. He's lost all his kids, all his health, all his wealth. His wife's done went nuts. You ever notice people who are totally broken like that? You ever notice their voice? They don't have much of a voice. They're, they're, they're actually beaten down. And isn't it interesting? God goes, oh, you want to talk like I do? You think you can thunder your voice like I do? So We can go all over Scripture, but here's one example. The Lord also thundered in heaven, and the highest gave His voice. Hailstones, coals, and fire. The voice of the Lord being representative of thunder throughout Scripture is all over the place. You ever notice that when people hear the voice of the Lord, what they do? Same thing. They hit the deck. All right? Now, 
I'm going somewhere. I want you to picture something for just a second. This man has been sitting here for seven days with boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He has been taking a broken piece of pottery. And why he's sitting in these ashes, he's scraping the pus out of the boils and it's intermingling with all that ash. When his boys showed up, if you can remember this all the way back in, I believe, chapter 3, they weren't quite sure it was Job. This is how bad a shape the man's in. Now, I want you to just picture for one second before I read the next verse, this man sitting here, scraping away pus, intermingled with all this ash heap of, uh, of, of just burnt trash all over his body. Not just arms. or It's from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And here's what God says. Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency and array thyself with glory and beauty. Now, if you didn't know that was God, would you think, man, what a jerk. Right? I mean, look at how bad a shape the man's in and God's going, hey, Job, why you think you can disannul my, my judgments? Why you think you can maybe bring me down to your level? Why you think you might be as strong as me? You think you can thunder like me? Oh, by the way, while you're at it, Deck thyself in majesty and excellency and array thyself in glory and beauty. The kids say today, I always like saying that, kids say today, get on my level. God just said that. That's what he's telling Job. Get up on this level. Because when you see God, you know what he is? decked with majesty and excellency, arrayed with glory and beauty. Then he goes on, he says, Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath, and behold everyone that is proud and abased in him. Look upon everyone that is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together and bind their faces in secret. He says, listen, you going to look down on all those people? I can this is God doing all this. And you got to stop and think, oh my goodness. God, lighten up on the dude just a hair. He's in bad shape and you're, you're hitting with some low blows, God. Until he gets to this verse. He says, if you can, if you can, Dissing all my judgments, if you can bring me down to your level, if you're as strong as I am, if you can thunder out the way I do, and if you can array yourself in glory, then will I also confess, in other words, I'll admit unto thee that thy own right hand can save thee. You know what he just said? Job, you need me. You can't do this. No matter, and, and, and guys, this is where mankind gets. We always, even us Christians who have been born again, we get this stinking idea every now and then. I got this one, God. No thanks, God, I won't need your help today. I got this one under control. And the idea is, if we could do all that stuff, we wouldn't have needed God anyway. But the idea is, we can't do any of that. And so, God, we need your right hand to save us. All right, point number two, the perplexity of an animal. All right, now I want you to pay attention. We're at the 13th animal, and he's called Behemoth. All right, so far we've covered lions and ravens, mountain goats, hinds, and uh, wild asses, and, and, and peacocks, and, and, and ostriches, and eagles, and hawks, and grasshoppers, and horses. And all those you know, we also dealt with a unicorn. And we kind of know of a unicorn, right? But now all of a sudden we got to an animal that nobody even knows what that is. 
What's a behemoth? Now, pay attention, and I know that the vast majority of the people in this room know that I use a King James, and they know why I use a King James, but just for the sake of those that may be watching online, what we're about to break down, your Greek and Hebrew will not help you. You will not break these verses down by using Greek and Hebrew. You can't. How did God tell you and I to study the Bible? Second Corinthians, or Second Corinthians 2, was it 10 through 14? If you want to know the Word of God, God says, I'm going to reveal it to you. How are you going to do that? By comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. In other words, comparing Scripture with Scripture. The idea is to run to the Greek or the Hebrew every time we get a chance and go, well, what do you think it really means? Hang on, because this is the one time that's not going to help you. Now hang with me. So we've gotten to behemoth right here, right? He says, behold now, behemoth. Now, I want you to notice that the traditional explanation of behemoth is an elephant, a hippopotamus, a dinosaur, a mythological creature, a crocodile. Matter of fact, if you're using any other translation other than mine, you probably have a footnote next to the word behemoth which says this could be this or this could be that. We don't really truly know then you don't believe Scripture the way I do. I believe that every single word of God matters. So why would God give us a, a whole breakdown of a chapter over an animal that none of us know what it is? I mean, that's a pretty big waste of time, isn't it? Let's study behemoth. Well, what is it? I, we don't know. It may be a hippopotamus. I don't know. Maybe it's a crocodile. Right, watch this. And the reason they can't deal with this is because you're not going to find it by studying Hebrew. You're not going to study it by finding Greek. Well, we're in the Old Testament, so that's not going to matter. And just a little side note, since we're doing side notes. I believe that I have the absolute perfect Word of God in English, and I don't need those. And I'm going to show you tonight. Watch this. So the meaning of the word behemoth. Behemoth is a transliterated word, not a translated word. So let's, let's kind of break that down. So when your King James translators came along to this word in Hebrew, they realized we don't have an English equivalency for this. And so we're not going to translate this Hebrew word into English. We're going to transliterate it, which basically means we're going to leave it in its original form and give it an English spelling and an Anglo-Saxon sound. That's how we come up with the word, okay? So it's transliterated. And the reason being is because I believe God was making sure that they kept their filthy paws off of this word. And the reason being is, God wanted this word left in its original intent. Watch, okay? Behemoth is a plural word. The O-T-H in plural means Hebrew. Now, uh, or in Hebrew, literally means plural. Or It's like us putting an S on the something. But here's a better way to explain this. So, those, this word in Hebrew can be translated cattle, Okay? Cattle is a plural word, right? Like, if you got cattle, everybody, when I say it, knows, oh, he means multiples. Because cow is singular, cattle is multiple. Okay, this is the same type of word. Behemoth literally means beast, not beast, beasts, plural, like cattle, right? Okay, now, the word means animals, not animal, animals. So you can see it as beast, plural, animals, that kind of sense. All right, now, but watch. Verse 15, we have, behold now, animals. Behold now, beasts, plural. Which I made with thee, he, singular, eateth grasses and ox, lo, 
His singular strength is in his, his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He, singular, moveth his tail like a cedar. His, the sinews of his stones are wrapped together. Now, either, either Elihu who wrote the book of Job, or the translators, or God himself is really confused. Because we have something that would be like, behold now, cattle, plural. Then he gives you all the pronouns to go along with the behemoth, and they're all singular. So we have a animal, a singular animal, that's known as beast. Or animals. You say, okay, how are we going to figure it out? The Hebrew is no help here. Well, how do we study the Bible? By comparing Scripture with Scripture. So we've got to go somewhere in Scripture to find an animals that is one. Or a composite beast that is one beast. So we end up in Revelation 13, 1 and 2. And he says, And I stood up on the sands of the sea, and I saw, look at the word, a beast, not beast, a beast, singular, rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw, the beast, singular, which I saw, was likened unto a leopard, there's one. Feet like the feet of a bear, there's two. His mouth is the mouth of a lion, that's three. Okay, And the dragon, which we know from Revelation 12, is Satan, gave him, the beast, his dragon, the power and his seat and great authority. So what we have is beast, one, leopard, two, bear, three, mouth of a lion, four. So when John describes this beast, he sees one beast, this ferocious looking thing. He's one beast, but he has, he's a leopard, he's a bear, he's a lion. Okay, and you say, okay, what does all that mean? Well, it looks kind of like this. Now watch this. Daniel 7 Daniel has this same vision and sees the exact same thing. But watch, it's very unique because John describes him as that horrible beast looking like a leopard, feet like a bear, mouth like a lion. And he describes it in that exact order. But Daniel's going to see this thing and he's going in the opposite order. And you're going, okay, what's the deal here? Now watch this. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion, okay, had eagle's wings, and I beheld until the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth. And by the way, what were the wings done? They were plucked. Just pay attention to that. And it was lifted up from the earth and made, made stand upon the feet of a man, and the man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast... A second like a bear. Now notice we're going in the exact opposite order of John. And it, and it ri raised up upon its, itself upon one side. And it had three ribs in its mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they say, thus, I've got to get a drink. Thus, unto it arise, devour much flesh. After this, I beheld and lo... Another like a leopard. So once again, we're going the exact opposite. Which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads and dominion was given it. And after this, I saw it in the night visions. And behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. And I don't know why half my verse is off of here. And it devoured and break in pieces and stamped out the residue of the feet thereof. Now, I want you to notice. Lion, bear, leopard, dreadful looking beast. So he's looking this direction and John's looking this direction. 
So when Daniel describes it, he describes it, lion first, bear second, leopard third, a dreadful beast fourth. Now notice the iron teeth. We're going to notice these iron and brass things in just a second. But John is now standing on this side, and he's describing it dreadful beast, leopard, bear, lion, in the exact opposite order. All right? So these are the four beasts that Daniel saw. Now, you get to verse 16, and what he does is he lets you know what these beasts are. This is not a matter of opinion. It's not me and you going, oh, what do you think they are? I don't know. What do you think they are? Well, I think they're this. Well, that sounds good. We'll go with that. That's not how we break down Scripture. Now watch. He says, I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me known the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise up out of the earth. Okay? Now, and he says, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and pose, possess the kingdom forever and ever, even ever. All right, you move on to verse 19. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. Now this is that fourth beast that was exceedingly dreadful. Okay, remember, they're seeing an exact opposite. Whose teeth were, notice, of iron and his nails as brass. Pay attention to that. Which devour, break in pieces, and stamp the residue of their... Okay, now, when you start breaking down what these are, the four beasts that they are are the four kingdoms that come up out of the earth. The lion represents Babylon, the bear, Neo-Persian, the leopard, Greece, the dreadful beast is Rome. Okay, that's these. Daniel chapter 2, he shows you in a statue. The reason why Rome is seen in the legs is there's two half of the Roman empires. Okay, well, we don't have time to break into all that. But I want you to understand what happened was the Babylonian empire, the bear, ate up the lion. Then the leopard came and ate up the bear. And the dreadful beast ate up the leopard. So what's happening here is inside that leopard is the bear and the, and the lion, right? And, the, and ultimately the dreadful beast ate them all up. So Daniel's seeing it from this direction one at a time. John is standing on the other side of history staring back at seeing it this guy. But inside of this guy is these other ones, okay? That's the breakdown. Now, hang on. Now, all of a sudden you get to verse 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, speaking of the Antichrist. And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High and to think to change times and laws. And they shall be given unto his hands until the times and times and dividing of times. In other words, the second three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation. Okay? Now, we're talking about the Antichrist. Now, so when you say, wait a minute, why is God telling Job about the Antichrist? Well, because the Antichrist is Satan personified. Job, you know what your problem is? He's not telling him how the whole thing went down. He's pointing to the who that caused his problems. And he's saying, behold... Take a look at Behemoth. He's the cause of your problem. Okay? Now watch this. The Antichrist, that spirit, Behemoth, beast, multiple things. He says, which I made with thee. So he's going to break down and tell you about this. Now, most of us would read over that. Ah, which I made with thee. Job is a created being, and so is the Antichrist. So is Satan. Satan, you guys know what dualism is? You ever seen the yin and the yang? Right? It's in the Korean flags. It's, it's, it's all throughout the, 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 the Oriental world. But dualism believes that evil and good are just not, one's not good or bad, it's just they're working against each other, right? 
And so what happens is, to a lot of people, Satan isn't a person. Satan is just a, you know, a dark energy. And then we have stuff like this. Destroy all the negative energy. And so you got all these mantras, right? And you know what your problem is in life? You have all this negative energy around you. Really? No. Your problem is you have an enemy who is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's not an energy. He's a real individual. And the Bible tells you and I that we are up against principalities and powers. It's not just emotions. Man, we are up against real things. And Satan is a real dude. And man, he was a created being. And Job, what your problem is, buddy, is you need to look at this animals, this beast named Behemoth, because just like you were created, he was created, and he's your problem, son. All right? Now, he eateth grass like an ox. Okay? So this, this composite animal eateth grass like an ox. Now, Here's what's interesting. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, uh, above every beast of the field. Now, now, here's what's interesting. The serpent is Satan, right? We all agree that. Comes into the garden, he's speaking to Eve and doing their thing and convinces her to do the, the deal. And she eats, Adam eats, they're all in a mess. God comes in and starts cursing people. Okay. But he curses the serpent, and he says, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. Why cattle? Why the tie-in with cattle? I mean, really? Is it, I just passed some cows on the ride to church. They don't seem to be any... They seem to be having a good time. <laughs> Until they end up on my plate. All right? Now, bottom line is... Thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. There is a connection with Satan and cattle. Watch this. All right? Ezekiel 28 lets you know that he is the anointed cherub, right? Before he got bounced, the throne had four cherubs around it, but he was the anointed cherub that covereth. In other words, he's set up above it. So if this pulpit was the throne of God we got a cherub, 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 cherub and then he's set up above it and when you get into Ezekiel chapter 1 he starts describing these cherubs and he says their feet were straight feet and their soles of their feet were like the soles of a cast foot okay Ezekiel 1.10 as for the likeness of their faces, so he's told you what their feet look like, their faces they had four faces, the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. That ox being the cattle. So each cherub has cattle feet and cattle faces. Okay? Now, Ezekiel verse 14. And every one of them had four faces. The first had the face of a cherub, the second had the face of a man, the face of a lion, and the face of an eagle. Now, what's missing? With the face of an ox up here. Now he's calling it the face of a cherub. So these cherubs are tied with cattle. Satan was tied with cattle in Genesis chapter 3. S Satan was tied to cattle in Ezekiel 28. You say, what does all that mean? No idea. But I can tell you this much. I know what cattle eat. Grass in the field. Now watch. All right. Daniel 4, we have one of the greatest pictures of the Antichrist in all of Scripture, and it's Nebuchadnezzar. All right? It comes along in verse 15. He says, Nevertheless, leave the stump and the root in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass. That's the second time we've seen that tonight. In the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew... Let it be wet with the dew of heaven. 
Let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. And by the way, don't anybody say anything about my phone going off. I don't want to end up in a bar. Nice. Right? If you weren't here Sunday, you know nothing about what I just said. All right. Now. All right, so. All right. So. What well, would do of heaven and let his portion be with the beast in the, uh, uh, in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from a man's and let his heart. Uh, his beast's heart be given unto him and let him seven times pass him. Now, let me just clue you in what this verse means. He, God comes down and strikes Nebuchadnezzar with what's called lycanthropy. He's going to live like a beast for seven years. This picture of the Antichrist is going to live out in the palace grounds for seven years. For all you three and a half year tribulation dudes, I'm just pointing out another verse when you keep telling me I only have one verse for seven years. I know I think I have a plethora, right? But here it is. How long is he going to be out there? For seven units of time. He's going to be out there for seven years. And what's he going to be doing? He, 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 he's going to bands of iron and brass. He's going to be having his heart changed from a man's heart and be given a beast heart. Verse uh, 32 and 33. And they shall drive thee from men, and that thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. And they shall make them to what? Eat grass as an oxen. How long? Seven times shall pass over thee. Until thou, that the most, until thou know that the most high, high ruleth in the kingdom of men, giveth it to whomever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled with Nebuchadnezzar and was driven from men and did eat grass as an oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven. You know what ended up happening? He had, watch this, till his hair was grown like feathers, eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. We were reading about that lion with feathers, eagle's feathers earlier. Do you know who Nebuchadnezzar ruled? Babylon. Do you know who the lion with the feathers are? Babylon. All right. Now watch. What did he do? He ate grass like an oxen. So when you go back, he says, behold, behemoth. What's he going to do? Eat grass like an oxen. I wonder what all that means. I, bet I, I guess we got to go to the Hebrew. No. Compare scripture with scripture. We end up over here and there's Nebuchadnezzar. Who is he? A picture of the Antichrist. Everywhere we're cross-referencing Antichrist, Antichrist, Antichrist. What do you think God's doing? Hey, uh, Job, you know what your problem is? Uh, Satan. And then he's looking at you and I and speaking to us thousands of years later and going, uh, Behold, Behemoth, watch out for him. All right, now Watch. Behold, Behemoth, let's look at that. Look, now, lo, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in his navel of his belly. Now, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time here, but the strongest part of a man has nothing to do with his chest. Who cares how much you can bench press? Nobody cares. Every major athlete on the planet will tell you, your chest workout doesn't mean anything. Every sport I was ever involved with, from the navel to the thigh, is where you had to build. I don't care what you are. You, you look at basketball, you look at those guys drive to the basket, watch where they're at. They're low, they're pushing off from the core. You go skiing with me. Black, we, I, I ski double black diamond. You come with me and find out what hurts the next day. It's that midsection. Look at football players. They explode into a tackle. It's right there. This is what God's describing to you. And you know what he's saying? Don't mess with Behemoth. He is strong, be more than you can even begin to imagine. And we see these village idiots on television talking about, we're demanding demons and we're casting them out and we're calling them out. And we're All that trash. Guys, the one thing I'm not going to mess with is demonic forces. That's not even a game to me. It's not even a play. I don't want that stuff in my house. I don't want to fool with any of it. 
And yet I see morons on television acting like it's a game to mess with Satan. And my, one of my favorite scriptures in, is in, out of the book of Acts, where this dude is trying to jerk demons out of people, and the demons are like, uh, Paul I know, Jesus I know, who are you? Like in other words, listen, sit down, small fry. And you got me going, listen, if Michael, the archangel, wouldn't have went up against Satan over Moses' body, what makes you and I think we're going to do something? Now listen, I get there is a time to resist Satan, but we ain't on a war path either. We're just trying to do what God wants us to do and resist him. All right, now. He moveth his tail like a cedar. You ever seen a hippopotamus? Not a whole lot of tail there. This guy's moving a tail like a cedar. You ever look at Revelation 12, 4? Describing of Satan when he fell, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and he cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be des delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. All right, look at here. The sinew of his stones were wrapped together. Okay, now, the biblical word for testicles is stones. And if you don't believe me, you end up in Leviticus chapter, uh, I forget off the top of my head, uh, I should know this stuff. Leviticus, he starts talking about the qualifications for the priest to work the temple. And what he was saying is, if a man had broken stones, in other words, broken testicles, that word stones is used throughout scripture to refer to a man's genitalia. Now watch. The sinew or the, the skin of his stones are wrapped together. I want you to pay attention because a lot of people think to themselves, based on this verse, that the Antichrist is going to be a homosexual. Okay? They go and they say, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of a woman, nor regard the God any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. So he'll have no desire of woman. Okay? And most people have taught, and I did back in the early days, that he was a homosexual. I don't believe he's a homosexual. Read it again. The sinew of his stones are wrapped together. He's a eunuch. Or let me put it in today's vernacular. He's a transsexual. And you say, oh, that's crazy. Really? Is it? Why do you think that thing's being pushed so hard right now? Why do you think it's, do you think it's so off the wall? What is the uh, Secretary of Health? Is it the, is that the one that looks the ugliest man I ever saw? I, um, blonde hair lady, yeah, I think it's Secretary of Health. Yeah, she's scary looking. I, or he, or whatever it is. I, now, we have people in office right now that fit this bill. So it's not that shocking to believe the Antichrist who comes on the scene will be that kind of deal. Every, every one of you all freaked out about buying your Bud Light now because you can't get it because of whatever. You and Garth Brooks. Now, now pay attention. You think Budweiser wanted to do that? You think Target wants to do that? These are corporations being controlled from above who are told because they're, not only the social credit score that's going to go on humans, it's now going on businesses. And I could go into a whole thing about why they're being told to do what they're doing. Why in the world are they pushing this agenda so hard? Watch. You know who that is? That's Bathema. Breast male genitalia. It's from Matthew died. It's transsexual. Like, we watched this go down in Starbucks 10 years ago. Watched a dude transform. Was still a guy with breasts. You go, oh my goodness, that's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. And it's going on right here. The sinew of his stones will be tied. Okay, now. 
His bones are strong pieces of brass, and his bones are like the bars of iron. Okay, now, now here's what's interesting. 36 times brass and iron go together in Scripture. And almost every single time they have a tribulation connection. It's all talking about the Antichrist and how strong he's going to be. Notice this. This is uh, D Revelation 18 is the destruction of Babylon, right? And here's what he says. The merchandise of the gold and the silver and the precious stone and the pearls, fine linen and the purple and the silk and the scarlet and the, and the all fine wood and all manner of uh, vessels of ivory and ma manner of vessels of precious wood and brass and iron and marble. And I, I could take you to one after another after another, but we don't have time. Now, remember, brass and iron. Brass, iron. Goes back to Daniel chapter 2. All right, look at this. He is the chief ways of God. Talking about behemoth now. This is why I told you you'll never figure out behemoth studying Hebrew. The only way you're going to figure it out is just start comparing what God says over here with God saying this over here. As you guys know... <laughs> All I basically do is take an e-sword and take English words and trace them throughout Scripture. And you end up in the exact spots God wants you to be. You don't have to be a... Listen, the biggest way to mess up a good Bible study is with a college degree. It'll mess you up. Because what happens is all you need to do is take the book and believe it and start tracing through it. And God's like, check this out, check this out. I'll take the Spirit of God moving that way. All right, now watch. He is the chief ways of God. This behemoth is. All right, well, you get over here to Ezekiel 28 and 12, back to where we're talking about Satan when he was Lucifer pre-Adam. Here's what he says. Take up the uh, uh, Son of Man, take up a lamentation about the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum of full of wisdom, Perfect in beauty. This is talking about Satan. He was the chief ways of God. He was the next in line after God. He was the one running the show. And he just was like, I'm not satisfied. i got to lift this thing up above. And that's why he says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covered. He was the dude that got to sit here. And yet, he couldn't be satisfied. He that madeth him can make his sword. Now think about this. If behemoth is this strong as brass and iron and his tail is like hitting you with a cedar and he's pointing to Job going, Job, here's your problem, buddy. And if you and I just put ourselves into Job's mindset for one second and think to ourselves, how in the world could we ever go up against behemoth? There's one way to go up against behemoth, Satan. Watch this. He that made him, that would be God, can make his, God's sword, to approach onto him. There's one person that can control behemoth. God. You know how he does it? His word. Now watch this. I'm, I'm not going there. Uh, 40 days of temptation. Jesus is out in the wilderness. Satan shows up three times. You know what, Satan, what Jesus backs him off with? The book. Your only defense against the forces of hell is this book. It's not holding up a cross and you know, all that goofiness. It's not. it's not. It's not demanding demons to move around. You have one defense. And it's this book. Isn't that crazy? God goes, yeah, I gave you a defense against all that powers of evil. It's right here. And we act like, oh, you want me to read that? That's a pretty big book, God. And that's a pretty big enemy, too. Now watch this. That is inspirationally applying this. Let's talk about doctrinally. Matthew, or Revelation 19, Jesus is going to show up and be a muth. 
is going to be there in the valley of Megiddo and Jesus is going to show up and a sharp two-edged sword is going to come out of his mouth and check him right there. I mean, that is the day we're looking for. Now, we're almost done. Surely the mountains bring him forth food. Now, I don't have time to go trace all this because we are out of time, but check this out. In the New Testament, waters represent people's nations and tongues. And I, Revelation chapter 17 will prove that to you. Don't have to, time to go through it. In the Old Testament, mountains represented people, nations, and tongues. Okay? When we get to Revelation chapter 17, we have the great whore who's sitting on seven mountaintops, seven hills. Okay? What do those represent? Physically speaking, there is a lady sitting over there in Rome right now in Vatican sitting on seven hills who is in control of all kinds of people on this earth. That's speaking right there. But those seven hills that she's sitting on will also speak of the seven Gentile nations that are involved. And how does he feed? He feeds off the people of this world. That's why I told you a few weeks ago when Satan as the serpent was cursed to crawl on its belly and eat dust and I ask you the question what are you made out of? Dust. There might be something there for you to study. Now watch this. All right. Verse uh, 21 and 22. We're almost done. He lieth under the shady trees in what? In the covert. What does that mean? He's hiding, right? Of the reeds and the fins. Oh, it must be that crocodile. Well, hang on. Shady trees and covert. The shady trees cover him with their shadows. Not going to take you all to the verses. Uh, Jesus and John the Baptist and multiple people have compared men to trees. All throughout Scripture. Laying the, the axe to the root and all that. Men are known as trees. Where is the Antichrist hiding? He's covert. He's hiding under the shady trees. You say, is the Antichrist alive? Don't know. I think he is. I don't know. But if he is, he's hiding. Where is he hiding? Covertly. Out there in the men. You won't point him out. Matter of fact, it won't be known till three and a half years in who he really is. All right? Now, notice this. Behold, he drinketh up a river. And this is my last two verses. And when we're done, we're about out of here. Behold, he drinketh up a river, and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. Now, I, I got to just stop. Why Jordan? I've had the privilege to go to Israel and Sweetwater Creek is more impressive than Jordan River. And I'm not even saying that being mean. It's just not. It's That's it. Like you stand there and go, all that reading in the Bible, you think it's just massive, awesome. No! It's, the Chattahoochee looks like the Nile. Like it, it's just not that big. And you're going, what's the deal? Now think about this. This would be the first time written down ever that the Jordan River is mentioned. We're talking about in the land of Uz, Petra. Wouldn't it have made more sense that he swallowed up the Nile? But instead he says Jordan. Why Jordan? Because the Word of God is absolutely perfect. Watch this. He's going to what? He's going to draw up Jordan into his mouth. Notice this in Revelation 12. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into a place where she is nourished for times, times, and half a time, three and a half years, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that she might... That, she, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Verse 16, And the earth helped the wo woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which, is, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. The reason why he says Jordan is because he's tying it. We're not talking about something's going down in Egypt. 
We're talking about something that's going to go down in Israel. This is where the dragon happens. Daniel 9.26, this is my last verse. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people and the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof, the end of what? The end of the tribulation, there shall be, shall be with a flood. And on to the end of the war, desolations are determined. Like, you literally couldn't take chapter 40 and come up with anything other than the Antichrist and Satan. The only way you mess that up is to start listening to some PhD break down some Hebrew stems that we're trying to figure out. Well, in this one, uh, the Hebrew writers in ancient, blah, 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 blah. Listen. All you got to do is break down Scripture by comparing Scripture with Scripture, and you will be amazed at what God points to you. All right, I'm way past time. So God bless you. Uh, we'll all see you Sunday.